Colorado is home to many of the world's leading climate scientists. While they conduct much of their research in polar regions far from home, what they learn there provides insight into how climate change is affecting Colorado. The poles are the planet's thermostat, and changes there affect weather everywhere. Colorado is already seeing the impact of some of these changes. As a climate scientist, I do my work in Greenland and Antarctica because that's where the big ice sheets are that we make measurements on to look at climate change. We use ice cores to look roughly 800,000 million years into the past to look at levels of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. At times, the Earth has cooled off enough that huge glaciers have formed covering all of Canada, covering all of Scandinavia. The amount of carbon dioxide change between an interglacial period and a glacial period is 100 parts per million of CO2. It goes from 180 to 280 parts per million. This year, we hit 380 parts per million of CO2. I can look into the past and say, okay, when was the last time we had 380 parts per million in the atmosphere? The climate at, the, at that time, about 3 million years ago, is when we had 380 parts per million was a completely ice-free Arctic, a little bit of probably an ice sheet in Greenland, but there were trees growing up to the edge of the Arctic Circle. Not only was the Arctic warmer, sea level was 75 feet higher. 75 feet is bye-bye to Florida for the most part. We've increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by the same amount that was accompanying a huge climate shift. We're not stopping our burning of fossil fuels anytime soon. So we'll reach 400 parts per million. We'll probably reach 400 and something parts per million. I hope we don't reach 500, but this is entirely possible. These are big changes that are gonna have profound impacts. I'm Ted Scambos. I'm the lead scientist at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. It's a part of the University of Colorado. A lot of the work that I've done has been on these ice shelves in the part of Antarctica that's just south of South America. We've seen some huge changes in these ice shelves. Uh, over the last 20 years or so, temperatures have climbed remarkably, much faster than elsewhere on Earth, up to five times as fast. And because of that change in temperature, these ice shelves, which used to be stable and had been stable for thousands of years, are now starting to disintegrate. NASA satellite images of the Larsen B ice shelf show the largest retreat of Antarctic ice shelves in the last 30 years. More than 1,000 square miles were lost in just two days. The ice that used to flow into these thick plates that push out over the ocean, that ice doesn't have that plate of ice in front of it to slow it down. When we've looked at glaciers uh, that used to feed these ice shelves after the ice shelves have broken up, they've accelerated. They've accelerated tremendously by a factor of four and five and six times the speed that they had before they broke up. And all of these areas are showing more ice flowing into the ocean and contributing to sea level rise. Now when you think about that, when you think that after hundreds of years of moving at a certain rate, melting in the last decade and the last 15 years has begun to change the level of the sea, it gives you sort of a sobering thought about the future. The people that I talk to tell me roughly a meter of sea level rise by 2100. Many big cities along the coastal U.S., Houston, Miami, Norfolk, you name it, you know, a meter is, three feet is a serious problem. Unlike glaciers and ice shelves, which originate on land, sea ice is frozen water that forms in the ocean and is typically covered with snow. Native tribes in northern Canada who depend on sea ice for their livelihood are grappling with the effects of climate change. My name is Sherry Gerhard. I'm a research scientist at the National Snow and Ice Data Centre. For the last 15 years, I've been working with Inuit in Nunavut, Canada. 
documenting their knowledge of climate and climate change. What the sea ice means to a scientist is totally different from what it means to a hunter. If you strike the ice with your harpoon, it's expected to sound a certain way or feel a certain way at certain times of the year. Around the 90s, I started noticing that the ice was forming later and hotter in the summertime. The sea ice, we've been having earlier breakup and later freeze up for about the last seven years or so. We've lost three weeks of sea ice on either end of the season. Not only does shrinking Arctic sea ice pose immediate challenges for native peoples and wildlife, it also has profound implications for the rest of the planet. I think the simplest way to think about the Arctic is that it's the refrigerator of the northern hemisphere. But the Arctic is also covered with snow and ice, which is very reflective, reflects most of the sun's energy right back into space. That helps to keep the Arctic cold, helps to keep it that refrigerator of the northern hemisphere. But by warming up the Arctic and getting rid of that sea ice cover, we suddenly start to change the nature of that refrigerator. It becomes less efficient. Where the white sea ice once reflected 80% of the sun's heat back into space, the exposed blue ocean now absorbs 90% of this heat. The real message that we're trying to get out is that this warming is not like the past ones that the Earth has gone through. And the Earth has been warmer and cooler from time to time. There's been lots of change. Now, this warming is different. It's different in two ways. One, human beings have a big part in causing it. And two, there's seven billion people living on Earth that are dependent on climate pretty much the way it is. It means it's important to all of us because people are going to be desperate for resources, desperate for food, for water, for a better place to live. Every country on Earth is going to be impacted by this. Climate change is, in many places, lowering the amount of water that's available, which means you can't grow as much food. Climate change is making it hotter so that you have more hot spells which uh, puts people at risk health-wise, which makes us buy more air conditioners, which makes us use more fossil fuels. There's a lot of little nasty feedbacks that are in there. Interestingly, we here in Colorado are sharing some of those profound changes. Um, our Alpine is one of these cold regions that is very sensitive to climate change. And I'm sure that you know, many Coloradans who get up in the high country frequently during the winter and during the summer have seen those changes. The predictions for the future are a hotter Colorado, and a hotter Colorado is going to be a drier Colorado just because of evaporation. And I see us struggling with water. I see a lot of the traditional parts of Colorado, agriculture, mining, etc., becoming less important because of the large needs for water in those areas. In my idealistic vision, I see a state that is heavily invested in solutions and has a thriving economy based on those areas. We as Coloradans have been given a wonderful gift. It is in our best interest to be a leader in dealing with climate change because we are one of the canaries in the coal mine.